federal government started compiling counts of people experiencing homelessness in the U.S. in 2007. And I wanted to ask by a show of hands, do you think, according to the last point in time count, do you think that rates of homelessness in the U.S. are higher or lower than they were in 2007 when the count began? Higher? Raise your hand. Lower? So those brave few of you that raised your hand uh, second would be correct. Um, everyone close to the issue will tell you that the point in time count is an underestimate, certainly, of the number of people who are experiencing homelessness, but it is a useful barometer of where we are. Because the methodology is the same year over year, it's a useful barometer of uh, how we are advancing or retreating in the problem of combating the urgent crisis in homelessness in the US. But the public perception of homelessness, I think, tracks with what I saw from, from the room, that it's an intractable problem that really moves only in one direction, that it gets worse. This isn't surprising. As journalists, we in the media are relatively accustomed to coming to the story, to issues like homelessness, at moments when people are seeing the problem get worse, when people are seeing the visible manifestations of homelessness, encampments sprouting underneath un overpasses, uh, spreading in their own communities. And so we come to your communities and we do the story. Homelessness is an acute problem and it's getting worse. And so that feeds into a public perception that this problem can only move in one direction. But what's happened over the past 15 years in the US actually belies that impression. After 2007, which was the last high watermark for homelessness in the United States, there was a decade of steady decline nationally in the number of people in shelters and unsheltered in the US. Even in the midst of a financial crisis, even in the wake of an extraordinary recession, rates of homelessness were falling. Categories of homelessness, entire categories of people who pr were unsheltered, such as veteran homelessness, was falling in, in nearly in half over the course of the last decade. And then in 2016, homelessness started rising again. After about a decade of steady declines, it started uh, rising, not to the level yet that we saw in 2007, but year over year, we started seeing increases nationwide. Once again, dystopian images of spreading encampments started proliferating across your television screens and in your newspapers. COVID exposed how vulnerable our unhoused neighbors are to all sorts of things that you experience when you are, are experiencing homelessness. And now we've erased nearly a decade of that progress nationwide in where the numbers are today, except in a few notable bright spots that managed to continue reducing homelessness while other places were losing that fight. So at Headway, the initiative that I edit and that Michael conceived of and founded at the New York Times, we wanted to understand this. Why are some cities succeeding where others are failing? Why are some cities continuing to make progress on this challenge while other cities are continuing to move behind? And that question is what brought us to Houston. So Michael Kimmelman, uh, Headway, uh, the, the chief architecture critic of the Times, Headway's editor at large and founder, uh, went around the country to look at how different cities were responding to homelessness. He was accompanied for much of this reporting by Lucy Tompkins, our colleague who was with us at the Times uh, last year and is now at the Texas Tribune this year um, for much of this reporting. Michael, what brought you to Houston and what did you find here? <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, let me just go back. Oh, that's weird. Are you hearing that echo? Oh, maybe that's better. Um, before I... Before Headway started, I began to think about homelessness um, because uh, for me, being the architecture critic means really thinking about how cities work and how and urban affairs and um, you know that's obviously centrally about housing issues. And I met a woman named Roseanne Haggerty who um, uh, runs an organization called Community Solutions, and they they deal with uh, issues around homelessness across the nation. Um, and she uh, said to me, you know, homelessness has been declining. 
Um, and uh, like all journalists, that was a th one of those things that seemed counterintuitive and therefore really interesting. Um, and so I started to look into, a, as I said before we started, I was looking in California. I went to Washington, D.C., which was um, a city that was said to have been making interesting progress, especially around veteran homelessness. Um, and then when uh, we started up with Headway, um, Lucy and I went to Connecticut, which has also been a place that um, has been making headway, um, but uh, landed in Houston because it, it, all conversations sort of came back uh, to Houston uh, as a, a city that was large, complex, diverse, so you were not dealing with a sort of small, anomalous um, metropolitan area. Uh, but also that had um, made, you know, really significant and across the board um, uh, progress on this. And what was interesting there too was that some of the people I was hearing from in Houston didn't know this. So again, as a journalist, that was very um, attractive. So we started coming, uh, Lucy and I came, I think, um, first a y more than a year and a half ago. I'm trying to forgive me. I'm, maybe she remembers, but I. But there was. Uh, it was. Uh, I was really hot. That's what I remember. <laughs> uh, it was a July, so it's probably July, the year before last. And um, uh, and we watched the the decommissioning, as you call it here, of a of an encampment. Uh, and then we um, uh, stuck with the story in different ways. Lucy produced a piece about a woman named Wendy, um, who had w found housing in the city. Uh, the the larger piece we produced um, came from several trips and, and a lot of, uh, a big learning curve. But what we really were interested in, and I think what Houston revealed to us was um, that uh, however tenuous, however um, fragile progress might look like, uh, in Houston's case, it uh, was achieved by this very, um, remarkable systemic change. It had to do with more than 100 organizations in the city coming together and working together uh, and pooling resources. Um, so that the narrative about Houston outside, which was, well, you just have endless, you have no zoning, you have endless land, you have endless housing, it's no problem here, was not quite the story. And that it had something more to do with governance and, and systems. Um, and that's a difficult story to report. We can talk about that maybe later. But uh, it seemed also to speak to something about the character of the city. Rewind the clock for a second, sure. because I think uh, we've reported this story. People have heard Houston's made notable progress and has achieved some uh, some uh, remarkable strides in reducing homelessness in the city. But remind us of the context. Where was Houston in yeah. 2011? So uh, the, uh, Houston was one of had one of the worst per capita homeless rates uh, in the country. Um, in the it was the homelessness was rising in the late zeros and and by 2011. And uh, if I'm remembering this correctly, the Obama administration um, provided incentives for certain cities if they would adopt a housing first policy. Um, and Houston uh, signed up under um, Mayor Parker. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, it, it's, I, many of you are from Houston here, so you may recall, but um, the, it, was, it was a very serious problem before. Let me just say, uh, more than a decade ago, so um, Houston was able to reduce, this was the article we wrote, um, the homeless totals by about 63 percent. I don't know what that number is now. And over the course of those years, housed over 25,000 people. Um, and most of those people, overwhelmingly close to 90 percent of the people who have been housed, have remained housed after two years, which is really the more interesting statistic. Um, but I think one of the l last things I just want to say al along the lines of perception is that um, homelessness is one of those challenges uh, for governance, for journalists as well, as well as for people just every day, in the sense that um, 
you can house 100 people who then disappear from sight, but if there's still somebody sleeping um, on your doorstep or if there's a small you know, encampment up the block, your perception is that the problem persists, maybe even that it has grown. And that tension between public perception and pressure on government to do stuff and then the pace of change and the ways in which change manifests itself visually and otherwise, that's one of these very um, uh, specific problems around an issue like homelessness. It's akin to, let's say, crime uh, in the New York City subway. You will have possibly read about shootings and people being pushed onto the tracks of the subways. And I'm um, a New Yorker, even my cousin, a New Yorker is like, I don't want to go on the subway. The, the truth is that it is safer now in New York City subways than it was pre-COVID, and that your chances of getting into trouble on the New York City subway are lower than your chances of an accident every single time you get into a car. So, you know, it doesn't take much to, to determine people's views of things, especially to skew them towards panic and, and fear, B by you know what they see or read or, or one incident, um, yeah. So I think that's a natural segue to talk a little bit about what headway is, why we're pursuing the stories that we pursue and the approach that we take to pursuing them. So we launched in 2021, in December 2021, with the mission of exploring the world's challenges through the lens of progress. You hear that word, progress, and hopefully it summons in your mind the fact that every person's definition of progress is different. There are very few uncontested definitions of what constitutes progress. And so for me, there's one definition that is not. Uh, time progresses, time moves forward. And so part of what I see our work is trying to do is understand what is changing in time and what changes are possible in time. I, what changes are communities striving for and what changes are likely looking ahead based on the trajectories that we're on. So we're not, when you hear the word progress, a lot of folks ask me uh, as the editor, so is your role to do the, the feel good section of the, <laughs> the Times to tell the, to, to tell the happy news stories? And I see it precisely as not that, that we are not just trying to uh, we're not looking at a, a story like what happened in Houston and you know, patting the city on the back for having achieved notable successes. I consider any story we do to be a snapshot of a moment in time um, where what we can see is where change on our problems is possible and is happening in either direction. Um, we, uh, we, part of and parcel of our approach to coverage is what I call wonkily longitudinal reporting. Um, that what I want to do is follow our challenges and follow our approaches to addressing our challenges consistently enough and over a, a broad enough span of time to try to understand what is changing and where can other cities learn from our approach. So I come from, I live in Vallejo, California, a community, a city in the Bay Area, um, one of the most troubled cities in the Bay Area. If you've heard about Vallejo, you've probably heard about uh, our police department. <laughs> um, uh, but we also, like many other Bay Area communities, have a significant challenge with homelessness. I have many unhoused neighbors. And to me, it's not enough as a journalist to say homelessness is awful and it's happening and it's getting worse. It's also necessary for me as a journalist to understand, does it have to? Are there ways around that? Are there places that we as a community, a city like Vallejo, can learn from in uh, changing or uh, improving our approach to a problem like homelessness? Yeah, I mean, I think, um you know, this, there's also a question of the compact of trust with readers. So we've just told you two things which many of you may find counterintuitive, that New York City subways are safer than they used to be, and that homelessness is nationwide um, at lower than it was in 2007. It's not about good news, as Matt says. I think it's about um, the fact that we, as journalists, for a lot of reasons, uh, tend to um, focus on calamity, um, 
scandal, uh, immediate problems. It's the way, you know, we, we do these things often very quickly and also we are on a 24 hour news cycle. So part of Headway's ambition is to um, step outside that particular time uh, perception and to, as Matt says, look much more uh, longitudinally at things. And as a consequence, hopefully, to, um, to be able to deliver to people uh, a, a different perspective on the broader picture. So it isn't, it isn't, as we were saying, about good news, but it is that you, we, we want readers who we are, I think, I'm curious to hear from you guys, but um, I think readers have often become, or, or often becoming increasingly frustrated um, with the news uh, because they feel it's kind of relentless and also uh, relentlessly negative. Um, and then they'll hear something contradictory like, well, homelessness is declining, and think, why is that not being, t why is that not part of the story? And I, I think it should be part of the story. It's, it's about giving a broader and more precise picture. That's, that's our responsibility uh, as journalists. I, I just wanted to stress this because I really do think a lot of the resistance, both internally in journalism and, and even outside, is, as Matt said, you know, oh, they're just telling us that if you build a bike lane, you know, th then everything's great and this is not the way the world actually works. That's really not what we're trying to do. Um, we're trying to bring to bear the most ambitious forms of journalistic, investigative, and enterprise work um, to questions that are really complicated to sort of do constructive things to promote a kind of constructive conversation around them. But it's not enough from my vantage point as an editor to stop at understanding the statistical picture of homelessness. After all, it's a pretty cold comfort to someone who is sleeping on concrete underneath an underpass to understand that a statistic is, is putatively pointing in the right direction. So from my vantage point, um, part of what we have to understand is what lies underneath the statistics. So um, materially, what happened such that on a night in January in 2021, uh, uh, 25,000, some 25,000 fewer people uh, were counted living outside and in shelters than had been the case a decade prior. Um, it is important to understand what l lies underneath that, but it's also important to get the stories of the individuals who are experiencing homelessness and how that experience, uh, what lies underneath the surface of those statistics. And the other thing I would say, given our interest in change, given our interest in change over time, it's important that we not just take the snapshot, but that we can pay continued attention, that we come back. So this is what brought us back to Houston. All of you brought us back to Houston, of course, but especially we wanted to come back to the city to hear from the stakeholders in Houston who are living through experiences or have lived through experiences of homelessness in the city themselves, but who are also on the front lines of addressing the city's approach to homelessness. So yesterday, we were at the Houston Endowment, um, the uh, new building uh, a few miles away from here, um, uh, with a variety of folks from all over Houston who have been part of the city's approach from different parts, from the city itself, from parts of the public health apparatus in the city, from parts of the housing uh, community in the cities, uh, landlords from the city, um, to hear both what are their experiences now uh, since we've published the story, and what do they see as the challenge ahead? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what we heard. What, did, what are some of your highlights from that conversation? Yeah, I should say that uh, our other colleague, um, Terry Paris, is here, Terry Paris Jr., um, and uh, Terry organized this event. Um, a, a really fundamental part of Headway is that we follow up, as we say, but we also have engagement with our readers, which is um, different if possible, than the kinds of engagement we normally get in, let's say, a comment section. Terry had a, a organized uh, a series of call-outs to the homelessness piece that I wrote, and um, we had thousands of responses, that substantive, really interesting responses. Terry's building a sort of community of uh, people who are interested in this subject, and he organized this event yesterday, um, and Terry and Matt moderated. 
uh, and it was really interesting. Um, and a first conversation, I think Terry plans to come back and convene with different people and to follow um, the different paths of the story as, um, and we hope to help facilitate that conversation, but also to find reporting out of it. So for me, I, I thought it was, um, I thought it was interesting for uh, a number of reasons because it was focused not on looking back, but as Terry points out, this was really like, what are the problems ahead? Um, which is not, again, something that journalists often uh, do. And for many of the people there, uh, of course, this is their livelihood, and so one hopes that they um, have ambition and, and see the possibility of change. Uh, but the, we, Terry staged this really interesting thing in which he got people to stand in the middle of the room and imagine whether they thought change would happen, could be made on certain issues quickly or only over time, and then whether they were positive about those changes happening or negative. And it was really interesting to see that people kind of divided up evenly. Um, we moved folks around the room, so we actually taped off the floor and asked folks um, for what they felt needed to happen in Houston, essentially to build on what's been done here and to start uh, preparing for some of the headwinds that the city is about to run into. One of the things that we've heard through our continued engagement with stakeholders in Houston and that we teased in the story that we did in June um, is that we can't befitting the fact that every story is a snapshot, you can't count on the future looking like the past. There are several things that are now materializing uh, as headwinds in the face of Houston's progress that are worth taking note of. Yeah. Uh, for example, a federal funding environment that kick-started with the Obama administration's focus on housing first and that continued through uh, COVID-19 with federal relief and responses to the pandemic. Um, we're beginning to enter a different funding environment uh, for, uh, for homelessness around the country and in the cities where it's most acute. So part of what we asked the crowd that we assembled yesterday was what do you think are the most important priorities for Houston to undertake? Um, in the short term, or, or, or do you believe it's a short term priority or a longer term priority? And are you pessimistic or optimistic on whether it's going to happen? What was interesting looking at Houston was that uh, um, most folks clustered on the, the things that we think need to be done should happen right away or it should happen soon in the next few years. Um, but as Michael said, when we asked people to stand around the room based on whether they were pessimistic or optimistic that those changes would occur, uh, it was nearly an even split down the middle of the room. Uh, I was with uh, who we called the dreamers, <laughs> the folks who are uh, pessimistic that the changes that they felt were most necessary would be able to, to happen. Um, and we had another side of the room uh, that we called the doers um, that were uh, optimistic that the changes that they saw most necessary could happen. But part of what was interesting um, hearing from everyone was how much um, the public perception of the matter of homelessness and the political will that that perception drives is salient to how folks yeah. who are at the front lines of the challenge grapple with it. When people perceive that the problem is static, intractable, and unchanging, it drives a different response. It means, among other things, that there's more political interest in kind of clearing homelessness off the table and making it invisible and something that just is part of the, the air, part of the context, um, and that there's relatively less energy that's available for trying to advance on the problem, trying to explore what solutions have proven to be tractable. Yeah, I mean, I think it was interesting, Sylvester, uh, Mayor Turner uh, spoke earlier, and it was interesting to me, if I may say, that he spoke so articulately about Houston's um, approach to homelessness, and I think that is because it has become something that is a, you know, a point of pride for him and for the city, um, and that, you know, uh, that matters a lot to have that kind of leadership. The two things that I, I look come up all the time is y the housing um, crunch um, and whether there will be housing. And obviously, this is changing the perspective uh, of people involved in um, in placing people. And in general, if you can't, uh, if you don't have apartments to move people to, you can't decommission 
the encampments and everything becomes a problem in, uh, with the system. And that is multiplied if you have people coming in and buying properties <coughs> where the, con uh, the continuum, the coalition, has placed um, formerly homeless people, clients, um, and those new landlords are coming in and then pushing those people out, you're actually falling behind. And this is clearly the tension uh, that Houston is feeling at the moment. I think though, like all snapshots, uh, it, it's not necessarily clear um, what's going to happen next. Um, and obviously that's something we should be following, but the tension was around this. And finally, if I may say, I think the other thing that came up that to me was a little newsworthy was in the absence of those large funding streams from federal government, and obviously um, you know, state funding is unreliable in this, um, are there ways Houston itself can begin to um, find new uh, funding sources? And uh, how much of those are carrots and sticks, whether they take the form of taxes or tax incentives for developers or whatever? So I think the next conversation for us to have is around um, uh, with, with landlords and developers, um, and also with maybe some of the industries in the city that are so central to Houston's prosperity and have not been involved, like the medical center. Um, yeah. We continue to remain engaged, not just with the challenge in Houston, um, but elsewhere. Here in Texas, uh, we have an unusual uh, fellowship structure where Lucy Tompkins um, worked with us in New York uh, reporting from New York on the uh, on uh, homelessness in Houston on the story that we delivered last June and now Lucy is at the Texas Tribune continuing to report on housing and homelessness issues all around Texas um, uh, to get on the ground uh, follow-up and some deeper stories on what is happening in the state. <laughs>